Good morning. Welcome to this episode of Reflective Hour with Tammy Tony Butler. But you all know who the real host of this show is, and that's Christ. We invite the Holy Spirit into this time that we have together, into everything that we do. Let only spirit and truth guide us. Let only that guide us. May the light of Christ guide us this day and the days to come. As we strive to be more and more like Jesus, not of this world, not compromising this world, but following in spirit and truth, in joy, peace, unity, calmness, tranquility, enjoying the fruits of the spirit. Let his peace descend upon you as you listen to this. Let his truth be revealed to your heart, to your spirit man. Let this word permeate your very soul. Let it set you apart for kingdom use. Let it guide you as it's guided me. Let it strengthen you as it strengthened me. Rest in it. Trust in it. Obey it. Follow it where it leads. For are we not all disciples of Christ? Are we not all chosen? Did he not know us before he formed us in the womb? What our purpose was? What we to, were to do for the kingdom? on earth, as it is in heaven. Let him guide you today. Let his truth be the beacon of light in the dark world where you reside. Not everyone has had it easy. Those of us who have suffered need this word. Your greatest days are ahead of you. As you've been set free by the knowledge of Christ, every chain broken, every addiction removed, by saying yes to Christ and no to the world, you have been set free. Now you will be transformed. Your mind, your body, your soul, your spirit man. He will transform you. He will guide you. He will strengthen you. He will speak to you. Is he speaking to me now? Like a teleprompter in my ear. Telling me. Slow down my child. I'm with you. This is my time. With my flock. With my sheep. I'm the mere vessel. With which he uses. To speak his truth to be his oracle. Wow. To be used by him in such a way, it's humbling, fearful, and humbling. You can walk in that too. He wants all of us to have that close relationship with him. To 
seek him above all else, to isolate with him, especially when you're in the valley and you're going through a challenging time. Climb that mountain. Get alone with Jesus. Let him alone speak to you as he used to do that with his disciples when he would teach them. That's what you're becoming, right? A disciple to carry his truth to a dark, dying world, to be that bearer of light, that bearer of hope. Is that not your purpose? Go forth and prosper. Prosper in hope, peace, joy, stillness, calmness. As you're facing any storm, he is right there with you, the cornerstone for which to build your church. Because remember, we are the church, the pure bride. We're fluid, like living water. Christ moved from place to place as he obeyed Father. The disciples moved from place to place. The Holy Spirit that's in us gives us the ability to take the kingdom with us wherever we go. We have the ability to speak kingdom, to speak truth. And our words have power. Our words resonate in the hearts of his people. Are you a follower of Christ? Are you going where he wants you to go? Or are you compromising with the world? That's what today's episode of Reflective Hour is about. Now let's dive into his word and see what. Christ has to say about all this. When we look at Luke 9, the New International Version, it's where Jesus sends out the 12. And I'll be reading from the word now. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for your journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, Stay there until you leave town. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now, Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead. Others that Elijah had appeared and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Harold said, I beheaded John. Who then is there? I hear such things about. And he tried to see him. Then we go on where Jesus feeds the 5,000. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethesda. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, 
send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd, about 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets is long, of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus predicts his own death. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must de deny themselves, take up their cross daily, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their soul or their self in this translation? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Continuing on in 27. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Then the transfiguration. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to them, to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Jesus heals a demon-possessed boy. The next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions, 
so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Jesus predicts his death a second time. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so they, that they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. How many of you have been afraid to ask Jesus for something so that he can be your deliverer? and communicate to you his heart, for you have, uh, are of his heart. Never be afraid to seek him, his healing power, his merciful truth. Now we continue reading in 46. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you, all who is the greatest. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop because he is not one of us. Do not stop, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. Samaritan opposition. As a time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. Remember, Jesus did not come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. His mercy and grace saves us all. The cost of following Jesus, continuing in 57. And they were walking along the road. A man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. What is that saying to us as believers, as to followers of Christ? as to the bearers of the light, of his truth. We're to follow him at all cost. We are to lay down everything to follow him. Let us not love anything in this world. No one can be put before Christ, before God in our lives. No one. The devil will often try to come at us through those that are closest to us. We must hold steadfast in our faith and to the truth 
abide in the vine. We must never be swayed to the right or to the left. We are to go straight along the narrow gate, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, on the truth, the life. He is our everything. He will carry us through tough times. We must not compromise with the world. We must not compromise with the darkness. We must only follow the light, his truth. As we strive to become disciples, Jesus, delivering his message to his people, Let's look at how he does this. Let's look at Jesus' method of leadership. He sought to empower his disciples, instruct them in his ways. That includes spiritual warfare, remembering to put your body armor on, as it says in Ephesians 6. Read through that. Be familiar with that scripture. Put your body armor on every single day. Every day, you put your body armor on. Without fail, you say in Ephesians, you speak Ephesians 6 out loud over you, over your life, over your faith. Instruct them how to deal with trying times and adversity. Get alone with God. Go up to the mountain like he did with his disciples. Isolate. Because remember, when people say to you, where are you going? What are you doing? Why are you pulling away from us? You're pulling away from the world and you're going to be alone with your father. It's not isolation, which is a bad thing. It's isolation, which is a good thing because you are tethering in to God, to his word, letting the Holy Spirit speak to you, spirit and truth to your spirit, increasing your spirit man. So that when you go back to the valley and to the people, you can pour into them like living water, never turning those away that need you. Because you've been filled back up with a wellspring of living water. A well that will never run dry. But you have to remember to get alone with God. Do not listen to the world. You know what you're doing. Take your time. Strengthen your spirit, man. Strengthen your faith. Endure the storms. Hold them accountable. Do not cooperate with sin and set healthy boundaries and borders. Do not compromise with the world. Set a boundary. If there's someone in your ministry or in your family or in your, your space that is destroying your peace, that is destroying your joy, your ability to Hear the Spirit, the whisper of the Holy Spirit, to cooperate with God, to obey God. Then do what you need to do to establish a healthy boundary in love, but a healthy boundary no less. You're responsible for the tech, protecting the peace of your congregation, of your followers, of your home of the land that you're called to possess for the kingdom. Whether that's in the classroom, whether that's in the courtroom, wherever that is, make sure you maintain that peace. Put those boundaries up, those guard posts in place. Boundaries mean that we love ourselves. And that's the first thing that predators or anyone, controllers, abusers tried to take from us. They want to erode our boundaries. Let us not love ourselves. But when we love ourselves and strive to be the best that we can be, to obey God, to not be a partaker of this world, but of our kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, we must put boundaries and borders. And Jesus will give you the strength to do that. Love and obey, Father. Surrender. 
not our will, but his be done. Boy, that was a hard one for me. As someone who survived childhood trauma, you know, childhood multiple sexual assaults, a survivor of uh, human trafficking and, you know, um, one who survived the, the death of her father through suicide and so many things. Oh man, my journey was one. We used to have to go into dumpsters for food and I was bullied in school, made fun of. I was actually even bullied at work. Even as a nurse, I was bullied. I was bullied in, in my chosen career and field not so long ago. Someone tried to make me do something that was not of this world. That the world that I reside in, the kingdom, I would have had to compromise my faith and follow a worldly crusade even. But I chose a heavenly pursuit of God's truth to remain ethical, pure. You must do the same when faced with temptation, when faced with this world and choices of the world. Will you choose the world or will you choose the light? Will you be a disciple or will you compromise your faith? What is the role of a disciple? They received power and authority. It says that in his word. We must remember, though, as disciples, we need to feed people physically and spiritually. Before I minister to anyone as a minister of the gospel, as a messenger of his word, as an oracle, I make sure that they have the ability to listen. Can they listen if their belly's empty? I make sure those I minister to have been fed. There's times God calls us to fast. But remember, there are people starving everywhere, starving for the word of God, starving for food, we are to be the bread of life. Show them Jesus, which is the bread of life, I should say. We are to show them the living water, the well that never runs dry, which they can drink from. So they hunger and thirst for the Lord. But we have a duty and obligation as the bride of Christ, as the church, to feed the hungry. Not just spiritually, but physically. Cast out demons. Deliverance, cure diseases, physical illness. Preach the kingdom of God. Heal the sick mentally and spiritually. Passing out spirits, spirits of infirmary, spirits of addiction, spirits of despair, spirits of depression, spirits of hopelessness. We have the power and authority to cast those out. Just as Jesus did. That's what it says in his word. That's what we can do as disciples. You just have to believe it. Walk in it. Walk in the power. And for someone like me, who was an intellect, I had to get that out of my head. Even nursing out of my head and the limitations of science. Because when we follow God, there is no limitation. God heals. And if you're struggling with something, you can be healed. And I'm professing that you are healed now in the name of Jesus. We bind and rebuke every spirit of infirmary, every spirit of doubt, of despair. Every sin of sexual perversion, we bind and break and cast to the pit in the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess at the name of Jesus. That's the power and authority we possess. I walk in it. You can walk in it. Characteristics of a disciple. Deny self, flesh. Die to self. Rebuke lust of flesh, lust of the eye. Father, we rebuke any spirit, any lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. We break it off now in the name of Jesus. We're to follow and obey. Prioritize God. 
get alone with God, isolate ourselves on that mountaintop when we need to, so that we can be equipped for the valley experiences. We have to uplift ourselves in our trying times as leaders. We have to praise ourselves to break through, worship our way to break through. Learn to seek God with everything. Relationship is better than sacrifice. You sacrifice for the right reasons and obey his will, not yours. And when you get alone with him and you have that relationship, you're better able to carry out his plans and obey because you know the heart of the father. You know his will. So you have to establish that relationship, just like you, you, you know, you had to with parents, which I, I never had anybody to show that to me, uh, really, that were not struggling with their own addictions or trauma, uh, just trying to do life in survival mode. So uh, for a long time, I had the world defined. Then I had to isolate, get along with God, go on my own spiritual journey. And um, he purged me of so many things. I had to go through the refiner's fire. He purged me of self. He took my job from me. He's like, no, no, no. You can't rely on money. You can't rely on the things of this world. Remember, take up your cross and follow me. I had to go to where I had, had nothing, no income at all coming in, and I was making very well as a nurse. He's like, no, none of that stuff. You have to rely on me. I sold my house, my sailboat, everything. Purged ourselves of all of our possessions. Moved, he moved us to a 10 acre parcel of land with a beautiful body of water. And we thought we were gonna have to live in a tent, but he was able to grace us with enough money to have our little tiny house. It's only 576 square feet. And that includes the porch. Do you know what I learned? That's all you need. He gave me what I needed, not what I wanted. He's taking care of us in so many ways. I am richer than I've ever been, full of joy, have life like never before because he broke off addiction. He broke off all of that from me. My sex addiction, my food addiction, everything. He broke it off. My insomnia, panic attacks, all of that. I don't have any of that anymore. He set me free. He can set you free. But I had to walk a difficult path. He had to show me the junk in my trunk, as I like to call it. He had to purge me of self. I had to die to self. I had bitterness in me. I had comparison syndrome. And I used to think I wasn't worthy. I would self-sabotage. I'd get angry. I'd say things I regretted to the people that were so close to me. It was hard for me. I was not nice to a lot of people, and I sinned. I used to curse like a sailor. I did all those things. I, I, I know Father doesn't like it when I say this, but I, I don't feel, I'm sorry, but I don't feel worthy enough to be sitting here with you, but he says I am. I was a sinner, and boy, did I sin. I did a lot of stuff. I let a lot of people down, and I hurt a lot of people. He broke me free of all. I was cultivated and born in a womb of trauma. He formed me before he put me in the womb. But sadly, the world shaped me. The world shaped me through adversity. Decisions that my mother made that put me in, in harm's way, but she was shaped and molded in a womb of trauma and she repeated the past sins of her generation. That's what we're facing today. So many of us have a story. We have a testimony. God can restore you. He can redeem you. He can set you free as he did me. You can walk in the light, in the peace and joy and hope that Christ brings. You just have to tether into the vine. Realize that nothing in this world matters. Anchor into him, for he's the only thing that will keep you. He will never leave us nor forsake. We have to be teachable and moldable and willing to be purified and refined, full of humility, 
not the world. We have to free ourselves of worldly influences. I don't watch TV anymore. I don't listen to music other than worship music. I don't let anything enter my ear gate or my eye gate. I control my surroundings. I control who I'm around. I have to, to follow Christ at this level. For him to place me in this position to be able to teach and mold his flock. I have to. I have to make sure that I'm tethered only into him and that I isolate with him. I've had to let go of friendships. I'm in a season to where he has called me to be alone with him, to seek him and his truth so that I can help him lead many to Christ. As you will do when you're transformed and renewed in mind, body, and spirit, having the heart of Christ, the mind of Christ, having the soul transformed by the spirit of God, you will set many free. We all know it's him doing, it's not me. But we have to be his hands and feet. We have to obey and surrender. Hear his whisper. Follow him where he leads us, even if it doesn't make sense. Even if you can't see it. We are to let nothing stand in our way. Not finances, not anything, not people. If God calls you to a city, you go. If he calls you to a church, you go. If he calls you to a platform, you go. If he calls you to the pasture to shovel manure, clean out stalls, you go. That's what he's had me doing for several years now. Getting alone with him. Watching over Hope, our cow, cats, our land, his land. Planting fig trees and fruit trees and him helping me tend the garden, teaching me. He's been teaching me. Just through the simple task. That's what he'll do. He'll purge you of anything and everyone around you. So that he can mold you and shape you. Into who he needs you to be. And who he's calling you to be. You have to be willing. To be refined. Purified. Set apart. For kingdom use. To be that pure bride, that faithful remnant that spreads his truth to a compromising, dying world. Are you ready? Are you up for the task? I am. You can too. You can be shown the way. Your only answer when God calls you, when Jesus calls you to follow him is yes. And amen. Take nothing with you. Worry not about anything. You have to trust that he will provide. You have to trust that he will provide. My message to you. You're being sent out as messengers. Chosen. To prepare the way for the Messiah to come once again. And establish his kingdom. On earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of heaven is alive in you. Take it with you wherever you go, wherever he leads you, and do as he commands. The kingdom of heaven lives in your heart, and the word is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. Let's look at a few scriptures as we close this out in our time together. 1 John 4.4, 4, New International Version. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Luke 17, 21, the New King James Version. Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within. Let's look at that in the Amplified Bible. Nor will people say, look, here it is or there it is. For the kingdom of God is among you because of my presence. His presence dwells with us. We have access to the kingdom. We are the kingdom when we follow him. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. Little churches going around everywhere. Taking the gospel with us. The living, breathing word. Romans 14, 17. Amplified Bible. 
For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking what one likes, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The New International Version. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13. New International Version. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amplified Bible. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing through the experience of your faith that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will abound in hope and overflow with confidence in his promises. Joel 3.16, New International Version. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. New Living Translation. The Lord's voice will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth will shake but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a strong fortress for the people of Israel. Amplified Bible. The Lord thunders and roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem in judgment of his enemies. And the heavens and the earth tremble and shudder, but the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold of protection to the children of Israel. He's our protector, our provider. John 3, 16, Aramaic Bible in plain English. For God loved the world in this way, so much that he would give up his son, the only one, so that everyone who trusts in him shall not be lost, but he shall have eternal life. In the International Standard Version, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his unique son so that everyone who believes in him might not be lost, but have eternal life. His truth put before us today. His light shining upon us, preparing the way for future disciples for the kingdom of God. You're embarking on a journey to be his chosen vessels, a royal priesthood, daughters and sons of the king. Go forth, be victorious, conquer. His word never returns void. And I am professing over you today, prophesy in his name. You've been set free, chosen, a royal priesthood, to carry out his will and his will alone. In him, you will find abundant life. You will find peace and joy and a rest like you've never known. And you will be richer in spirit than ever before. Worry not what you'll wear. Worry not what you'll eat. Worry not where you'll lay your head. He'll provide as he's provided for you. Go now. Do his will. Seek him. Seek the kingdom of God first, and all else shall be given to you. That's this episode of Reflective Hour with Tammy Tony. Soak in that peace. Soak in his presence. As I pray a prayer to close us out. Abba Father, Lord Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Cover them with your blood, Jesus. Your protective blood. Your power and your might. Strengthen them, oh God as they strive to be the hands and feet of Jesus. 
as they strive to forge a way where there's been no way before. To go to uncharted territory for the kingdom of God. Guide them and keep them as they walk from village to village, city to city, nation to nation. We will be a world built on the foundation of Christ, on the cornerstone. We will bear his light to a dark world. We will speak his truth, even in a world and culture of compromise. We will not be a part of this world. We will be transformed by the renewal of our mind, body, and spirit. As we seek the cornerstone to build our church on, our true church, and establish the foundation and the borders of the new temple. The temple of Christ within us, his power and glory in us, resonating hope to a dying world, strengthening the masses wherever they are, whatever the adversity they're facing. Trust in him. Trust in his word. Seek him, seek his people. Seek him for healing. I profess to you today that you've been healed in the name of Jesus. Any drought you're facing will now see increase. Any famine will cease now. And you will be filled and sealed by the blood of Jesus. Go forth and prosper with a powerful testimony of what God has done. But we are transformed, set apart for kingdom use, sanctified and purified. Go forth now, come with his blessing in the name of the Father, Son. Amen. Oh,